Welcome back to Vedic Life Coaching and welcome to the Masters of Starlight series. Today, our special guest is Lisa Romero. Lisa is an internationally acclaimed author of inner development books and courses. She is also a complementary health practitioner and has worked with top educators around the world since 1993. Lisa's most recent initiative is the Astral Arc, a YouTube channel devoted to providing a space where people can see how their own personal inner development impacts the world at large. Lisa, welcome to the show. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for having me and inviting me into this space. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the audience would love to know definitely more about your YouTube channel. I was looking at that yesterday and I was so enjoying the series that you've put together where you're going through you know the well I guess we could call them yeah astrological archetypes uh you know we're going through Aries Taurus like this you're taking people through each sign I'm thoroughly enjoying that because what you're bringing to the astrological world is something very unique and I do believe that your the wealth of your knowledge your background everything that you would have done would have contributed to this place where you are making this incredible channel so I thought the audience would definitely love to know that journey you know how you began and and how it's come to this place where you are teaching this incredible subject now uh, I'd love to know how how your trajectory has been and what has led to you creating the incredible YouTube channel that you've got now. Wow, that's a that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's actually started um, very early for me. This interest or willingness to discover who we are and why we're here. Um, I, I was 15 years old when I first went to India and started mm -hmm. to learn about meditation and engage with those questions of consciousness. It is a bit young, I must say, because it, I couldn't really m merge into the usual kind of upbringing once I had awoken to certain realities. Mm. That uh, was the very beginning, and by the time I was in my uh, well, late teens, early 20s, I was engaged more with what would be known as Western esoteric schooling. And Western esotericism has, for many um, years, been in a certain way held in a certain secrecy comparatively to the Eastern meditative path and Eastern development. But over the last couple of hundred years, more and more has unfolded. And now it is much more available for um, anyone to engage with. In a certain sense, the deep mysteries of life were held back for the chosen few, mm -hmm. those that were ready for initiation. And now we know that the collective consciousness is ready for this. The collective consciousness is, is awakening to stepping forward and developing a genuine relationship to the spiritual world and to understanding who we really are and why we're really here. Mm -hmm. And so my path went from learning about Eastern um, methods and technique and meditation and understanding into uh, Western schooling. And in that um, schooling, I came across Rudolf Steiner's work. Mm. And Rudolf Steiner really, for me, uh, gave the framework of which made sense of all the schoolings, in a way, East and West. Um, he speaks in it around many different pathways and how in this framework you can begin to understand where you are and where you can take your next steps and unfold but it still has this deep aspect of western uh, esotericism which really is meditation in the marketplace mm -hmm. in a way 
where one um, realizes that your development actually does support the world development. Some of the philosophies speak about, you know, in a way, learning to come to self-realization so you yourself can get the hell out of Dodge, you know, you can get off the wheel of life and death and, and get out of here. And then there became this evolutionary shift. We hear that shift streaming even through the eastern paths that says, actually, how do we support each other mm-hmm. to this awakening? So Western schooling is very much about that, meditation in the workplace, living with your life fully, deeply, and having a deepened, individualized connection to the spiritual world and growing in your initiation through life, through the trials of life, that are not just the inner trials, mm. but how we meet the world around us. Amazing. This is amazing. And it's bringing up all kinds of questions with me. Just yesterday I was watching someone who, she was a coach and she said that a lot of her clients, they don't have a good relationship with the word God. And, you know, that that word, I'd imagine, you know, with your experience of looking at the East, of looking at the West, and Rudolf Steiner's work, it seems like his work is, now I tried to read about him yesterday, and because when I was looking at your biography, I ended up studying a bit of Rudolf Steiner yesterday and a bit of um, Madame Blavatsky as well. I ended up bringing up their charts and sort of trying to get into their work. <laughs> yeah. And um, so this is great because I feel like you can teach us, you know, introduce us to these two incredible people in history. Uh, but so tying back to God, it's interesting, like if, with Rudolf Steiner's work, if you don't have a relationship with that word God, is his work a great way to get into, like for perhaps Western people to get into spirituality? Would I be right in saying that? Great way of putting it because he really, um, in a way, speaks about more the divine ideal. Mm. So what is your divine ideal? If you're a Christian, that may be Christ. If you're a Buddhist, that may be Buddha. But it may be love. It may be nature. In a way, you can really recognize that there is something in your life that turns you towards something that's beyond you in in an uplifting way. Now, the interesting thing about that is with the indoctrination of religion, for, for many people, the so-called um, divine ideal does not uplift them because it's been an indoctrination through their upbringing that actually feels that it makes them feel less than or mm-hmm. squashes them or diminishes um, who they are. But if it's truly your divine ideal, it wouldn't do that. It actually helps you to draw towards it in that sense like Rumi says what you're seeking is also seeking you and in the heart of your love for life and your love for the spiritual world you know your divine ideal when you come across it Mm -hmm. now it can take people a while to really put words to these inner experiences but there is a sense for many people that we are beginning to need to put words to it because religion itself is not holding it because of its, um, I suppose, its disappointing effects on humanity. And, uh, I mean, that's a a very light way of saying it. The betrayal, perhaps, of the divine that's happened through not all religion of course and not certainly not all individuals at all mm-hmm. but the way it's been um misused has wounded the psyche in such a way that sometimes the word christ or the word god or the word buddha can create in itself a um aversion to the divine which means it's an aversion to something in your own being. And that's where making that adjustment, and Rudolf Steiner was, although he had definite pictures about the 
evolution of consciousness and in a way the purposefulness of certain masters or great teachers entering into the world at certain points in our evolution and he has a, a a framework around why that was is useful for us as a collective nevertheless it is embracing all divine ideals and it's really up to us to find that in ourselves and underpinning that which is really something about why i ended up um bringing this work onto the YouTube channel, was part of this divine ideal is also to ask the question, how does your divine, how would it um, be in the world, be with others? Mm. So if, for instance, you're a, a Christian, the, the, divine, the divine ideal may um, express itself in um, ways of being such as the willingness to sacrifice to to love one another to love thy neighbor if you're a muslim it may express itself in these forms such as um, hospitality and you know this willingness to see the best in the other and um, in, in in buddhism it might be a gesture around loving kindness and compassion mm. so each of these divine ideals in a way, gives expression to virtues. Yep. And in that sense, you could say a moral activity or way of being. So if I can imbue my life with this way of being, I will get closer yep. to emanating my my own divine ideal. Yep. So along with the divine ideal, we have what we may understand is our own living moral code. Mm. And that, when I was listening into what was happening in the times of COVID and whether people were looking at politicians or the way things were handled or the way people were experiencing what was taking place, there seemed to be a collective call to how do we develop greater morality when it's not being indoctrinated or, you know, this is right, this is wrong, but it's deep moral impulse from us each as individuals mm. and in that listening in I thought well there is these wonderful exercises that are given as inner practices to build a relationship to virtue in your own being so you can begin to understand these facets of love because they're all actually aspects of love <laughs> And so I thought, well, bringing the virtues may be a contribution to that. And at that time, there were many people seeking something because everyone was locked down, the young people were going online, everyone was saying, where is the spirituality? How do we get a foothold and a resilience in facing what we're facing? And so, yeah, I started to do a lot of my work online. And then the question was, how do we reach people that have never heard of anthroposophy before, never heard of Rudolf Steiner's work. And so through some young people that I was working with, they suggested a YouTube channel. Mm. And that's how it came about. So on there, there is offerings from young people, conversations with them about their path, as well as um, artists and their work and them expressing um, in a way grappling with the path of inner development so I that's where the virtues uh, work came in and it has been really useful to to work with that in a wider scale because I'm used to working with people that are already in a way very um connected to a particular stream or understanding and to to work with these inner development exercises with the reality of anthroposophy, which says inner development is really also for world development. Um, and I think that's something very essential today because you, know, you can see in a way, sometimes we grab, grab hold of self-development for selfish reasons, yes. um, rather than, okay, we really need to say, how do we, how do we support the world going forward? 
-hmm. and that's where the virtue practice came about and yeah I've been really enjoying bringing it this is amazing this is so good and to me it's like the true path of spirituality is looking at what's in me like what's out there is what's in me I change what's in me and the outside will change which is a really hard pathway to commit to if you if you're doing it right like if you're really doing it like it can be it can be quite difficult and it's interesting when I watch psychologists and some self-help and self-development people some of them don't like that kind of view actually because they and there are there can be issues with it because sometimes in that process we can be very hard on ourselves uh you know ego can use it as an as a way to suppress the self or beat up the self or you know that that can happen which is why I'm loving your work because it's so gentle and so inviting and so so much freedom you know uh in those those beautiful videos I, I i managed to watch aries and taurus yesterday and there's so much love there's so much care there's so much it's the right path you know so this is this is quite interesting how have you navigated uh some of these issues around you know yeah when working with this principle of the outer and the inner how yeah. to not be too hard on oneself, how to, you know, not be self-punishing either. Because the self is, yeah, like part of the all is one as well. Well, it comes from this deep esoteric wisdom that says, human being, you are a concentrated image of the world. Mm -hmm. World, you are the human being poured out into space. Now, yeah. that's something to think of. Oh, that's huge. <laughs> That, that with the zodiac and we connect to the different parts of the body to the different zodiac we can get a sense of this deep relationship and alchemy has always, always looked at this between for instance the kidneys and venus or liver the liver and jupiter mm -hmm. and how medicine and health come together out of this deep link between the cosmic forces that are streaming and the what lives in the human being so our health comes about partly through keeping that relationship between this great spiritual cosmos and the human being in harmony. Mm -hmm. The egotism that we face, which is also the part that can beat ourselves up strangely, is not actually in harmony with that. Yeah. And we've, we've, in a way, developed a way of being with ourselves that um, you know, causes a certain amount of self-punishment from our own disharmony. Mm. So first of all, on the path, we really try to take this first step of awakening a relationship to the divine in yourself and in the world. And although in that light you may perceive the shadow, even mm. more greatly yeah the idea in that process is that you see the shadow but you turn your attention to building what you want to come into being so if you imagine that your time energy and attention is like the sun it, it's going to make things grow the what it focuses on mm. and so you yes you're aware of it it's not to deny that we all have things to overcome but it is also important to build upon the work of what is already in you harmonious and to grow the harmonious in you, which gives you the strength and the love because harmonious parts of you, the divine parts of you, are connected deeply to love, to lovingly take hold of those things that in us need to be transformed. And many of those things actually belong to a collective conditioning and um, how you can or can't be, how you should or shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, they've take, We have fallen out of our own um, reality of who we truly are mm -hmm. and why we're truly here because our world has been diverted. 
in the great traditions, it was always known when we came to the world and we can see these in archetypes that we would seek a relationship to the spiritual world. And that was um, uh, esoterically given through this uh, word gold. You would seek the gold. And the diversion is we've taken that gold and become about seeking wealth. That's a great mm -hmm. diversion. Our world has now been... We're not here seeking the divine, the divine that's spread all around us, but here we, we focus all this energy on seeking the wealth. Mm -hmm. And you can see these diversions of what we really come here to understand. Mm -hmm. We, in this conscious awareness of who we are, gets diverted and we spend all this time, energy and attention mm -hmm. on wealth. And it's not to say that Wealth does not have its place. Mm. It is taking so much. We look at what happens. We're all, this is part of our great moral questioning. Mm. What, is it really healthy what we're doing to humanity or is this wealth in, uh, we follow the money and is this really love that yeah. we share with each other or is this follow? So when we truly realise there are diversions in the collective, and those diversions have deeply in, in penetrated all of us to some degree, then the great work of working on myself is also working on the world. Yes. Because we are a cell of this great body of humanity. And if we are functioning and harmonising in the it, with the light, we affect all those cells that we come into connection with. And I feel like we're, we're, we're all getting this now. This is not just those in the know. <laughs> yeah. We can say it, it is clear. But, you know, at the same time, we have to be true to the humanity that we are. This is reminding me of a, a, a verse by a poem by Haviz. Haviz is a mm. Sufi poet. Yeah. I want to read, he says, it's always a danger to aspirants on the path when they begin to believe and act as if the 10,000 idiots who so long ruled and lived inside have all packed their bags and skipped town or died. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a sense, he brings humour to this yes. relationship we have to have to those parts of ourselves that, in a way, aren't that intelligent. When you really think of what it is to strive for in life, Mm. Yeah, we turned our way from love to to wealth. Yeah, just and it's time to turn. It's time to turn back. We know that it's time mm. to reunite ourselves mm. consciously, individually, and that's where the challenge is. Because in the past we had great gurus and teachers that could do it all in a way as guidance for us and here comes the the real crux of where we are as a in our evolution of consciousness that each of us now has our own guide mm -hmm. so how to awaken that divine that we can then work to keep growing and taking hold of this piece of land yes this yeah. part of the world and yeah. transform that yes and you're right, you have to be cautious. You know, it says, you know, in the esoteric school, in be careful not to burn or drown in the process because the shame that we can feel by realising how little love lives in me, that's yeah. a painful thing to carry. Yeah. Or the fear we can feel when we realise that to do this work, I may have to change aspects of my life. And will I be okay? Will I survive mm. if I don't mm. bend my time out for the for what everyone else is out for? What the collective has been driving us to be out for? Mm. That level of security, the finances, and the right people, and the right clothes, and the right mm. the right is. Yeah, the story. It's so true. This has got me thinking about how, like, money as a system has kind of cheapened society and culture 
and yeah and 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 what we aspire to like it's it's funny I was thinking about this last night that um certain sort of affirmations were coming into my mind like you know I didn't come here to just pay my bills I didn't come here to just you know that that, that can't be it you know I didn't come all the way to earth to just you know be an employee or pay bills or pay there's it's like there's got to be something more to life to this right. experience and it's that's the true wealth the true abundance the gold that's inside and when I've been looking at um like Lester Levinson I I watched uh, I I listened to his talks a lot during those pandemic years 2020 to 2023 and it really reconditioned my mind to this all is one perspective that I am one cell of the whole body as you said and you know I'm I'm really wanting to live out of uh, these concepts and and the one thing that I could imagine people would struggle with and and this is where I think your work is incredible because it's also practical and what I'm loving about your work is that, so when when we say that, well, the wealth is within. So when I think of within now, I think of the all is one. I think of everything. So I'm having to use an abstract part of me to think like that. So, yeah, I think some of this thing can be very abstract for people, that everything is within and, you know, uh, not to look for a salvation or for our joy in the outside world, you know, that, that it's all within me. I don't need anything from the outside. It's all within me. This is a concept I've certainly been working with, and but it's abstract in nature. And I think for some people, they might find it impractical or difficult or, you know, uh, to, to live by some of these ideals. Well, in a certain way, if we were to take these these pictures in the in their esoteric light and consider that, um, we have these realms of consciousness within ourselves. We yeah. have you might think of waking day consciousness. We also enter into a state of consciousness which we call dreaming consciousness at night, and mm. we also enter a state of deep sleep consciousness, and we could argue that we also go into a state of what we call death consciousness we don't know it but we know the human being when it's not in waking day consciousness dreaming conscious sleep consciousness some are also in a different realm of being or entirely where mm -hmm. they don't have this physical body now if i think of those consciousnesses can be accessed through my own being then I can recognize in a certain sense they're all within. But there is also a realm of being of which they exist in. So my waking day consciousness exists in this sense perceptible world. And the sense perceptible world appears on the outside, yeah. which it is, but it's also reality of awareness of it is connected to something on my inside. Mm behind the sense perceptible world we also have the behind the kind of veil of the sense perceptible world we also have this kind of picturing consciousness where the image of something is more than just the sense experience so let me give that an example perhaps to the listeners mm -hmm. if you were to close your eyes and imagine the rising sun. Now, this is a picture of the rising sun. Mm. But you're also going to let that be an experience. So you can picture it and experience it. Now, the soul works a little bit with comparison. So now also change and imagine a, 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 the full moon in a darkened night sky and picture it and experience it. Now, for some of you, this is very easy. You realize that I, as I build an imagination of something that I've perceived in the sense world, 
mm. I also experience something. Yeah. And the experience is another layer of awareness. The sensory perception is one layer. I see the sun. Mm. How many days do we see the sun but have no inner experience of it? Mm. But those that awaken a little more realize that the sun is not just this thing that I see, it's also this this thing that I experience. Yeah. The moon is not just a thing I see, but it's a, it's a beingness, a mm. beingness that I can experience. Yeah. And those experiences bring about a whole other dimension to our reality. Yeah. Now, many people, unfortunately, walk around this earth in a sense perceptible way only they mm. don't experience and yes. it's i think part of the reasons we close off to experience is because some of them have become sort of so ugly or hard to experience yes and yet if we were to experience we wouldn't likely to produce as much ugly and hard because we would understand that actually beauty is really important for the developing child beauty is really important for our community it's essential yeah so it's having that realm of experience mm -hmm. that you have in your being that when you're actually in your dreaming your dreaming is pictures of everything you've experienced that day yeah. but you haven't taken in consciously yeah. so when you're awakening you're not just staying on this sense perceptible world you're also living with the experience behind yes now this is tricky it's really tricky because often we come up with solutions that are practical sense perceptible rational intellectual they all make sense but what does that do to the inner experience of the human being mm. how does that experience actually help us feel harmony and disharmony yeah. how does it actually make it help us feel so we see this, you know, the world wants you know, advertising everywhere. Well, that is for, but what's it doing to the interior world of the human being? Yeah. So we have got, got what I called in my last book, <laughs> an industrialised interiority. And that means that our inner world is getting blunted or deadened. Yes unless we learn to awaken to those other realms of being. Absolutely. This is reminding me of uh, Ram Dass, who he talked about like when his heart was expanding, he's becoming more spiritual and um, he has talked about how like he would feel too much and it's like you have, you have to switch off in order to be able to, to do a life, to do a practical day-to-day -day life because yeah he was he was feeling everyone's pain too much and you know he, yeah so it's an interesting one with the heart that we need we definitely need you know and and I think empathy is is making a comeback in the world uh yeah. you know it, so many channels on YouTube that are full of videos just about narcissists you know, and uh, these are all made by empathetic people who are educating the world <laughs> about this this realm. So that we can see that the empathy levels are increasing on the planet. This is wonderful. People are feeling what it is to be the other more and more. Uh, yeah. And, and in that process, you know, I remember Ram Das when he talked about that that he's certainly doing that a huge amount more, but he was having to shut down as well to protect you know, to, to be able to do the day-to-day -day life as well. And it's a balance of both. It's about it's about doing both sometimes maybe. But it, I, I love this phrase, industrialized interiority. That is genius. That, wow. <laughs> that is really wonderful. And, you know, for quite a, a while I, I worked in advertising, much to my shame. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making, I'm, I'm then, you know, there's some karmic rebalancing happening now, I think, with the work I'm doing now. So, uh, yeah, in some ways, I feel like my Jupiter Mahadasha was, I worked in advertising and, you know, now I'm this Saturn Mahadasha, I'll, I'll work doing this and I'll somehow pay off whatever I did there. But, you know, advertising, it was, it's, it's a, a thing of, um, I love what you said there about 
you know, how it impacts the heart. And I think it, it puts a huge amount of pressure on people, just unnecessary, ridiculous pressure that just, you know, and, and again, I think people are very good at tuning that out. So just as Ramdas was saying that, you know, for his own survival, he was having to shut down and tune some things out just to do a day-to-day -day life. I think a lot of people, they are, you know, using ad blockers on their computer and, uh, and 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 it's just, it's becoming this awful wallpaper that's lining the world. And but people are, I think, pretty good at tuning that one out. Because when I worked in the profession, I used to we used to write things and come up with ads. And uh, the strategy was, well, nobody, everybody's actively avoiding whatever it is that we're saying. So how do we get through? So these are the kind of conversations we'd have in there about this. Well, you know, and also there are so many good things in the world and how do we learn about them if they're yeah. not brought? True, in, true. You know, yeah. how do we get what we really believe to be true out into the world? Yeah. And we know that apps are being made literally to create habits and mm -hmm. in, in people so you constantly bring someone back. And yet at the same time, we're really trying to say, well, how would we share the good mm. if we're not going to advertise it? Uh, I know with the YouTube channel, I need to get a certain amount of subscribers yeah. to turn off the ads, and I, not, I don't have that right until I get those subscribers. I'm like, well, you just subscribe so I can turn the ads off? Yeah. <laughs> but, the, but the reality is, is that if we can um, think about this power of love which is a power of transformation these questions have really been interesting for me re recently how do we bring money back to the spirit mm -hmm. how do we bring so-called advertising back to the spirit mm -hmm. i heard someone recently that comes from the it world that just says if you're working for a company that's not moral get out and get out now yeah there are also IT companies that really are working towards this new way of being. Mm. I'm sure there are people in the advertising industry that are saying, how do we do this? Well, we're not just trying to create the hook, but we're really trying to say we are not just greenwashing or whitewashing or doing all of the stories which um, are told are going to create the hook. Mm. How do we express ourselves in a way that's the most genuine and do that as lovingly as possible and see, and here is the interesting thing, here is the interesting thing, the more each individual resonates with the goodness, truth and beauty in their own life, the more they'll resonate with those that are advertising those things. And that's what we have to build. We just have to keep building that relationship between ourselves. Yeah. Now, it is interesting because in the inner development path, the idea is, is that firstly, you, you, you do, in a certain sense, create a way of not being influenced by things you don't want to be influenced by. Mm. It's a boundary in one sense. Now, we do have people that are sensitives, and I do talk about that on with one of the young people on the channel because mm. people that are sensitive get open to experiences that they don't even want to be open to yeah hard to close down yeah. and so the inner development can help with that but there's also this other aspect about the love developing the capacities of love mm -hmm. and i call it the work of love because it's not about love as in desire or love in the familiar, or even karma, which draws upon us this intense need to be with someone because we have to work certain things out. Yes. And in a way, um, we have, yeah, we have to meet what we have to meet. And so some people can be in situations which appear to be off track, like your advertising mm -hmm. may appear to have been off track, yes. but actually it's led you to here, in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah, and there were so many experiences in there that... Yeah. Uh, massively useful were setting me up for exactly this exactly. so I, it was valuable and useful in so many ways yeah and there's a probably a lot of good people in there now doing that very work but can they bring love to it can they transform it 
So I know people that actually know how to bring love to money. I, uh, me, that's not one of my my roles. I can't do that. But what can you bring love to? Yeah, they're doing the right task. If you can't bring love, to that and move on. <laughs> love it. What can you bring love to? That is yeah. the goal of life. That's, that's it, that's, isn't it? Like that's quite something. Like if you're choosing the work you're going to do in the world, can you love it? Because if you can yeah. love it, you can bring it back to where it needs to be. Yeah, you can love the information world that we're going into, you're going to bring it back to the whole. But if you're in there for the money, if you're in there for the social standing, if you're in there for some other driving force, you're not going to bring it back. Mm -hmm. So I think it's you should say, do what you love and you'll never do a day's work yeah. in your life. Absolutely. Also this idea, do what you love because we need you to do what you love. Yeah. You'll bring it back. Imagine the world in a certain sense has fallen away from love, from what yeah. I would call God. Absolutely. Or, yeah. or I would call it all sorts of things, but yeah. it's love. Yeah. Okay. About agreements in all religions and all traditions, there's a kind of agreement. Yes. Love, right? And there is these ideas that love is not, as I was saying before, it's not just or a, a, a feeling I have because you please me. Mm. It's a work of love. The mm. work is transformative. Yeah. It puts something to the best it can be. Yeah. A, a parent loves a child, they really are saying, how can I help you be all you need to be? Yeah. How can I make a mini me? How can I, you know, force you to be what I want you to be so you please me? Yeah. And so that's not love. So we're looking at what is really love? What is the work of love today? Mm. And that's for me why the work of the virtues is actually a part of that because you start to get to understand there are these master principles or facets around mm. love. Now, some of them I know and some I don't know. So how do I build more of love? Yeah. And how do I work in the world? What can I bring love to? It's a great question. Yeah, that's that's. I, I, met, I met this one person when I was working in in New York who worked for the Water Board, but he loved it. Yeah, and you're in the right job. Exactly. <laughs> there, yeah. you bring love to this. Yes, and you can see that he's constantly improving this work because he's he's growing it in this way where there's this deep love involved. Yeah. So yeah. if you love it, you're in the right work. Yeah, absolutely. If you love it, you need to question it, even if the work you're in is apparently seen as a good as good work. Yeah. And if a nurse doesn't like being a nurse, if if a doctor's a doctor, because your cultural world says, you know, when you grow up and you're a man, you can be a doctor or an engineer. There's your two possibilities. So true. That's very eastern. Yeah, that's a Big thing in the east. You have to get the results. Yeah. yeah. How do we do? How do we move away from that so that everybody has the place of which they can love? Yeah. This sounds very utopian. It sounds, yeah. Uh, you know, but it actually has a reality to yes. why we're here yeah. and who we really are. Yeah. And for me, that if we could just remember that mm. and get that track yes in, in a little way in our lives we will start making a huge difference to the trajectory of humanity definitely gosh if each person could do that it's so so powerful and one thing about love I really love what you're saying about um that it's not the thing we've can we've been conditioned to think it is and the deeper I've gone on my path, I've discovered that love and peace are actually the same kind of thing. And that when I was more in ego, oh, peace was boring. Peace was like there's something missing or there's something wrong. You know, so when I was more in ego, ego looks at peace and is, is like, oh, there's something wrong with life or it's it's too quiet or it's too boring or yeah peace in the ego's eyes is boring but as I've grown more spiritually 
Oh, I love peace. And I love like love and peace are <laughs> they go together. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's uh, I look for this quality now, like in yeah. as I go in, in in my days, where am I totally peaceful? Where where is there ease? And uh I, I've yeah, the ego used to con me into thinking peace was boring, but not so much anymore <laughs> thank goodness yes well I think there's a, a lot of these virtues we really don't know them in their in their depth of what they can be I remember mm. one of my first teachers said you know you can be a powerhouse of gentleness mm. now, if you really carry the peace you really carry the peace with you yeah. you're a powerhouse for others in that and it's not about making it exciting and this kind of uh, astral dynamic. And unfortunately, for some, the world is becoming so grey that they want the horror movie or the hallucinogen or something to sort of rattle the cage. But when you really penetrate these realms of consciousness out of your own activity, you realise how powerful they are mm. and you feel much more than what you would normally feel in your limited, conditioned amount of feeling. You know, sometimes my heart feels like it is going to burst. It's, yeah. so, it's, it's sitting outside. It's in my aura. It's not just this body. Yes. And to, to feel this around some of these dynamics, there's a dynamic of peace. <laughs> and that's this second stage that Steyer talks about. You don't just buffer yourself so that you – cannot you can let in forces at will that you choose to let in but you can also radiate those forces that have an influence positively on the atmosphere now the atmosphere some people that are sensitive pick up on straight away yeah. like if you've gone to the difference in the hospital atmosphere than the than a, a, a pub atmosphere or mm -hmm. a university atmosphere you feel the atmosphere then mm -hmm. pick up forces yeah Sensitives already know that, but imagine that your peace now affects the atmosphere. Now, this is the absolute reality that we just need to understand more, mm. realise how important our development is, because it is connected to the collective atmosphere. That is, has different names. We might call it the astral world. We may call it various things, but that is this collective sphere that we're all sharing. Yes. And if I'm filled with the collective atmosphere, sometimes I'm filled with an anxiety that's not even mine. Yeah. So how would I work back to help that mm. other than to be this powerhouse mm. of gentleness or peace or lo love in the fullness of it, where it can be? Yeah. Everyone. Yeah has some aspect of love i don't believe you come to earth i mean there may be a very few mm. uh, very very few that don't but every and we wouldn't we wouldn't really even want to speak of that because everyone comes with some facet of love to give yeah and we can grow that here and we can share that here and we can help each other with that mm. That's our purpose. That's really powerful. What you said there about your peace can be so powerful that it impacts the world around you. And that, and this is what empathetic and sensitive people need to know. That And I think there is a concept in healership where um, people talk about, oh, I did so much work, I'm now drained. But if you're working from the right space, you're a candle. I, I can't remember where this analogy comes from, that this concept of the candle that lights another candle, its flame is not diminished. Absolutely. And that's where we need to live from. If we're living from true peace and love, then, you know, empath doesn't need to run out of energy or burn out or no, the flame won't be diminished. It will just continue to light other candles um yeah that does not diminish because yeah you know someone <laughs> no yes exactly it multiplies yes, <laughs> yes. After I've loved I've already loved this life I can't possibly love someone else exactly exactly love. yes love yes. wants to multiply itself yes 
And and actually, that's uh, the more we understand love. And that sounds strange mm. to say understand love, but yeah. the, the more we can understand the great work of love. Yeah. But that is really a part of the the mission of our times, and that there are these facets of it in the virtues that we can come to kind of gently embrace. Mm. We don't have to have these feeling experiences that rip us to shreds. Mm. Although. That is part of, I just spoke about that in the the lion's gate, the portal of the lion, because you can feel that feelings, if we enter into them in the harshness, have this tendency to devour us, to to shatter us. Yes. But and build them from this real place of love where our feeling life is imbued with this activity of love. Mm. This gentle, sweet powerhouse yes. has a transformative effect. Yeah. It's never exhausting. It's yes. always enlivening. Yes, absolutely. Feelings. This is an interesting one about feelings. That feelings can be the thing that exhaust and drain a person. But love is. Yeah, love can never be exhausted or depleted it's where we come from it's what we return to it's what we are I learned this through Lester Levinson it's it's kind of and so yeah this is where is is love a feeling I think it's got its own category isn't it it's it's got its own beingness it, it, it just is well we, it is an experience and it is a multifaceted experience mm -hmm. So, you know, as we looked at the various virtues, you know, devotion or um, courage, mm. our experiences and patience, there's so many, there's so mm. many virtues which are facets of love. Yes. They are an experience and they do have a feeling nature to them because mm. any experience we feel, yeah. but they're not an emotion that will pull us around it's yeah. a true sense of the word feeling we've become to use this word feeling with the word emotion yeah. <laughs> and I don't want to go into any psychological aspect of that but really to to reconnect this instrument that allows us to feel profoundly deeply as an experiencing of life because we want to experience it all so that we can really learn but also to experience these divine qualities in the world yeah. now when you look at nature the experience often reflects back something of that divinity that's mm -hmm. why by this oneness can be understood even in the sense perceptible world because the divine in me as an experience can experience the divine in the natural world around me mm -hmm. we all have a certain registering of that now, in the sense perceptible world, the plants out there and I'm here and there seems to be a division. And as we move through other realms, that division diminishes. Mm. But my consciousness, whatever it surrounds, I am that. And so there is no separation even in the I-ness. Mm. While we live in this sense perceptible world and I'm here and you're there, what is it that unites us is connected to this divine stream. And that is connected to us being able to experience that. So the more I cultivate through the practice of the virtues, my willingness to experience all of these facets of love, the more love I'll perceive in the world, streaming from the other, the so-called other. Yes, yes. <laughs> so true. Oh, this is amazing. I feel like. I could, we're just about the hour. How are you for time? You're okay? So uh, I'm sure I'm got, time. I'm sure got, <laughs> we have time here. So. Time here. We do. Time is an illusion anyway. <laughs> Not on this dimension, but it no, is I know. how to work with the various realms of reality. And for, for myself, learning to actually live in three realms of reality simultaneously is 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 constant yeah. learning yes i i love the journey yeah. and maybe that's why this is good work for me because i can love it yeah. i really can love it oh yeah you're absolutely 
radiating so much love. You're a, a space in which I'm sure many people heal. Uh, it's incredible the work that you've done, and and uh, amazing that you know you've come to the astral arc. You're working with astrology now. It's, it's just so incredible. And what I'm really hoping is uh, that the viewers will definitely subscribe to to your channel and and. I will be continuing. I'm going to watch all of the uh, astrology series you've got. I, I love what's there. Um, I guess before we wrap up today, I wanted to ask you, this is something that I've been thinking I might do as a set question for all the masters who come on, and that is to ask you, what is your definition of leadership? Ah, I know it's a big question and to be just wrong <laughs> with that question. <laughs> big we question. Were just at a conference last week um, which was called Leadership in Transformation. Wow. And I was one of the speakers there. Yeah. And it it is really a um an important question of our times, isn't mm. it? Because if we are to kind of sense that we are all finding a sovereign way mm. our own being with with the divine and also we can learn from each other in this age we are all students and we are all teachers yeah. so the acknowledgement of that i think is really a part of the 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 leadership of of our times the acknowledgement of that uh, you know, on one hand, you could say, well, I'm a true Sagittarius. I never stop learning. Yeah, that's <laughs> I learn. And you've gone very deep into everything. And you, and boy, do you seek the truth. You are not stunned to <laughs> yes. find it. The truth seeker that is here to learn. And I, you know, I, and, but that's also one of the, um, the steps on the path of development to be a student, to study, to always be a student. Yeah. And I really live with that and you can feel that all truth seekers have that nature about them it's not a path where we're going to get somewhere mm. path we're on the path we're constantly learning and discovering and if our leadership could understand that and actually shift in the way in which it wants to work with uh, we know best you need we need more humility in that realm yeah and we also need to just understand more about the truth of it. We are a humanity. We are really a, we're working together. Yeah. Um, I certainly say if you, if you meet someone that you can learn from, it could be because it's familiar. It could be because it's karma, but it could be because there is something there that you know that they can help you unfold. And in that sense, you know, I see my role as maybe any other uh, teacher. Like I have a teacher at the moment that's teaching me to do ocean swimming. She's mm -hmm. wonderful. And now I could learn. She said, you can learn on your own. You could. You, you, could. You, you would spend a lot longer. You may actually get into some difficulties, but you could you know, get out there and learn how to swim in the open ocean and navigate all those things yourself. Yeah. But with her, she's so aware of what, um, she, she's been in the water for so long, she's taught this for so many years, mm. that she can say, oh, just adjust that, because if if you, you'll get further that way, or this is the point you look back and make sure you know where you are in a relationship. And I kind of see myself as like that swim teacher yeah. for, the, for the other realms. Yeah. Simply that. No one can do the swimming for you. No. <laughs> not, we're not in that age. It, 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 I would avoid anyone that says they'll give you oneness for a small price. Yeah. We're not in that age. We're in an age where our sovereignty and our own relationship it needs to be respected as we respect it in every other human being yeah. and our relationship to the divine. We mm -hmm. must learn to respect that in each other mm -hmm. and have this faith that we are really working that way. Be aware of those diverting forces. Mm -hmm. It speaks about that in one of his wonderful poems. 
you know, that, that promise you the world, but then lead you like a behind a farting camel. <laughs> it's not nice. Those diverting forces. So we, we, we have to be aware that they do exist. They really do exist. And they have impinged upon our life so that we have forgotten in this anaesthetizing world who we are and why we're here. Path of development allows us to awaken to that. Absolutely. Wow, that is amazing. It's amazing that you're swimming the open ocean, by the way. I would be too scared <laughs> to do that. The only way I could do that is I'd have a teacher and a life jacket and you know, <laughs> right by my side. And, you know, and I don't know if I could do that. That's incredibly courageous. Wow, that's amazing. But that... <laughs> say that about my relationship to some of the spiritual world too yeah. but you know I, we all have these te we have these teachers that we can learn from and they can help us get there quicker and find that security okay. and if you that's why we're useful for each other okay. and i know that that's why your work you know if we love the work we're in yeah. we're going to offer that somewhat to others that, that, that come and say oh tell me about that work that you love yeah, absolutely. And for me, I think today one of the most powerful things is, yeah, what can you bring love to? That is the big question. And I, and that is a guiding principle, I think, for everyone to, to just check in with that question now and then as we do our lives. Am I bringing love to something? And yes. that's, that's our purpose really we've all got we've all been incarnated with some love for something are we bringing our love to that that's incredible and we start where we are and then no part of the journey of life is to grow that yes At the end of my life I say I love more now than I did last week or last month or then I know that I've been on my path yes yep that's what we'll take with us into the next incarnation we're going to leave the house and the bills behind. We take it with us, our heart, our yeah. experiences. Um, and in fact, that's one absolute spiritual reality. Mm. The thing that goes with us is not the wealth. None of that's going, but your love. It's your love that moves actually through the astral into the devachan, to the upper devachan, to the high spiritual worlds. Mm. Love is the only thing that remains. Mm. Next incarnation there's no visa. There's no swathi. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> but your love will yeah. be there, and you'll go to you'll hopefully live a life where you grow that again. Yeah, yeah. Wow, amazing. To have this time with you oh, and to <laughs> your love. This has been amazing, Lisa. I want to thank you with all my heart. You know that. The little tiny spark of divine in me has been thoroughly nourished by the by the divine in you. Thank you. This, this has been a real treat today. Well, it's been wonderful to meet you and to meet your work and and the love of which and the love and care. And, you know, when I first heard you, I heard these qualities of love in your being and mm. I this is the person I'd like to speak mm. to. Oh, this is so special, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> And you're welcome, you know, if you're launching a new initiative in the future, Masters of Starlight series is here, you're welcome to pop by, you know. Oh, um, thank you. Maybe we'll talk further down the track when we'll get to the end of the Zodiac. And be lovely. I will fr would like to see how that can develop for people. Yes. The love is so important in our times and the more we understand it and, and work towards it, the, the better the trajectory of humanity is. Yeah, absolutely. And to the viewers who are here today, thank you so much for viewing. And I want to very much encourage everyone to subscribe to Lisa's incredible channel. It's going to grow massively over time. I just know it. And more people are going to find you and more people are going to be nourished by the love that is there. There is an abundance of all the wonderful virtues, love, wealth gold it's all there so definitely go and subscribe to lisa's channel and i look forward to seeing you next time mm -hmm.